Good morning. This is the Mac Road Church of Christ Sunday Samuel to Chronicle study. Today we're in 2 Samuel chapter 5. And let me remind you just real quickly of the book of 1 Samuel. Remember that it covered the, the life of Samuel and his death. Carried It talked about Saul and the fact that he became king. And then when he fell out of favor with God and David then became anointed and Saul was out to kill David. Uh, and it ends with the death of Saul and David becoming king over Judah. Now remember that as we talked about that, 2 Samuel then deals with David becoming king and David's reign, as you can see here on this line, moves up steadily, it becomes more and more popular uh, until he has trouble in with Bathsheba and then his troubles go cause his kingdom to, to wane a little bit and go down. But we're here with him reigning over Judah and he's getting ready to become king over all of Israel here in chapter five, if you notice, is where we're going to be covering him. And as we take a look at Chronicles, which we're studying with it, notice that Chronicles deals with the highlights of David's reign, starting in chapter 10. And we might take a look at David's life here in the book of, of Chronicles as we go through here, but we're mainly covering it in the book of Samuel. And then we're using Chronicles in those areas where we might need a little bit more information. So as we do that, let's remember that what we're looking at is David. And remember that David had just finished uh, making an agreement with, uh, with Abner. And uh, then Joab killed Abner. Abner, remember, was the commander of the army of Israel. And David had made an agreement with him that Abner was going to bring all of the army over to, to Judah or to, to David and make him king. And all of Israel was in agreement with this. But uh, Joab uh, decided that uh, it was a good time to take revenge on Abner for the death of his brother. And so he ended up killing him. And then David made that lament. And so this is where we're at now. Now in chapter 5 and down here at verse 1, uh, it says... Then, uh, then all the tribes of Israel came to David at Hebron and said, Behold, we are your bone and your flesh. Previously, when Saul was king over us, you were the one who led Israel out and in. And the Lord said to you, You will shepherd my people Israel, and you will be a ruler over Israel. So all the elders of Israel came to the king of Hebron, came to the king at Hebron, and King David made a covenant with them before the Lord at Hebron. Then they anointed David king over Israel. And David was 30 years old when he became king, and he reigned 40 years. At Hebron, he reigned over Judah seven years and six months. In Jerusalem, he reigned 33 years over all Israel and Judah. Now, I want you to I want to stop right here at verse 5, because I just want to talk a little bit about David becoming king finally. I want to notice a couple of things. I remember that Abner had gone out to get all of Israel to come over to David. And so even though Abner was killed by, uh, by uh, um, Joab, uh, Abner still uh, was successful in getting Israel to come, especially when Israel saw how sad was, how, David, how sad David was at the death of Abner and at the death of uh, Ishibosheth, who had been the king in Israel, who was killed while on his bed, if you remember, and then David put to death the two men that killed him as they thought they were going to do David a favor and kill his enemy. But as, as we notice, David doesn't treat his enemies like most people treat their enemies, and he didn't consider him uh, an enemy. And, and so it says, then all the tribes of Israel came to David at Hebron. I remember, David was living in Hebron and said, behold, we are, we are your bone and your flesh. In other words, what they're saying is we're related. You're an Israelite. Uh, you know, we're, an, we're Israelite. You're Israelite. We're, we're family. And not only that, but verse 2 says, and previously when Saul was king over us, you were the one who led Israel out and in. In other words, when Saul was king, it was David, even though Joab was the commander, it was David that people looked at as the, as the, the one who would be victorious in the battles and, and the fighting and the skirmishes. So it was David who came with Abner, and he would bring in the army, or he would take uh, go out with the army and bring in the spoils. And so that's what they're referring to. Not only that, but it says, and the Lord said to you, you will shepherd my people Israel, and you will be a ruler over Israel. So the 
the uh, uh, 11 tribes or the 12, the, uh, the 11 tribes, they knew that God had made David shepherd over Israel, why it took him so long in order to, to uh, anoint him or recognize him uh, is another thing. And it could be simply because uh, Abner had, had been controlling the northern tribes to the point where uh, they weren't allowed to come back and get, get in with David. But now that Abner's dead, and now that Ishibosheth is dead, and now they're coming to David uh, in order to make this agreement with him and have him be ruler over all of Israel. But they recognized that God was the one who said that David was going to be the shepherd over Israel. And by the way, uh, when it says over Israel, it's not just talking about the northern tribes, but also Judah. And so sometimes that's a little difficult. Sometimes when it says Israel, it's referring to the northern tribes and sometimes when it says Judah, it's referring to the southern tribe uh, but usually unless there's a division when it says israel it means all of israel including judah and all the other 11 tribes and so that's what's going on here now verse 3 says so all the elders of israel came to the king of at hebron and king david made a covenant with them before the lord at hebron and so david makes his covenant and notice that he makes it before the lord that means that he makes it with the Lord's presence. Now, every agreement you ever make is before the Lord. The Lord looks at our agreements. He understands our agreements. And that's why in the New Testament, it says that we're not supposed to swear by heaven or swear by the earth or, or, or swear by something else because God sees all our promises. And so as soon as you make a promise or as soon as you say you'll do something, God's already heard it. And so you're making that agreement in the presence of God. And that's why New Testament Christians don't have to swear. Now, I, I believe we can make promises, like, for example, if you buy a house, you promise to pay it. I don't believe uh, God was saying you can't ever make a promise. What he's saying is, is that our promises are not, not contingent on who we make the promise uh, on. In other words, if I make the promise on, for example, you know, my mother's grave, that's different than making a promise on, uh, on God. No, it's still a promise, and God sees all promises exactly the same. And God expects us to keep our promises and to not make uh, any promises that are are that we're actually going to break. But we make a but we make the promise in such a way we think that we have a loophole and we think therefore that we can weasel our way out of it. And so that's the idea here. When David makes a covenant before the Lord at Hebron, and it says, "Then they anointed David king over Israel." So they anointed David king over Israel. Now remember, David was already king, and as we notice down here in verse five, he had been reigning over. Uh, over uh, Judah at Hebron for six years and six months before they finally made him king over Israel, the whole uh, nation of Israel. And so David becomes king over the whole nation now. And so the nation now is unified, whereas before it was divided into two parts, you might say. And that's important because we're going to notice what happens a little bit after this. Now, verse four says, and David was 30 years old when he became king and he reigned 40 years. So David was 30 years old when he became king. So he reigned 40 years, so that would make him 70 years old at the end of, at the end of his reign. So he's about 70, 70 years old or, or, or 71 years old when he, when he died uh, and Solomon became king. But he reigned 30, uh, 30 years uh, over all of Israel. And so altogether, he reigned 40 years. And, and that, that's where we notice. And so it's divided up in us in verse 5. Where it says, in Hebron, he reigned over Judah seven years and six months. And in Jerusalem, he reigned 33 years over all Israel and over Judah. And so he, he was uh, a, a king who reigned a significant number of years. And it's interesting that a lot of times those rulers who rule, they ruled about 40 years, which is considered a generation at that time. And that's also probably what Jesus meant when he said that... Uh, to the, to the Jews, this generation will not pass away until you see all these things happen in Matthew 24, the destruction of Jerusalem. And Jesus died about the year 30 or 33. And then Jerusalem was destroyed 40 years later in 70 AD by the Roman Empire. And so for 40 years seems to be the idea of a generation during that time. So David reigned for a generation. Now, verse six, it says, now the king and his men went went to Jerusalem against the, uh, the Jebusites, the inhabitants of the land. And they said to David, you shall not come in here, but the blind and the lame will turn you away. 
thinking David cannot enter here. Nevertheless, David captured the stronghold of Zion, that is, the city of David. And David said on that day, whoever would strike the Jebusites, let him reach the lame and the blind, who are hated by David's soul through the water tunnel. Therefore, they said, the blind or the lame shall not come into the house. So David lived in the stronghold and called uh, it the city of David. And David built all around from Milo and inward. And David became greater and greater for the Lord God of hosts was with him. Now, I want to notice this, sec this section down here that talks about uh, uh, <clears throat> the gaining of Jerusalem. <clears throat> now, I notice that, that Jerusalem was of the Jebusites. And if you remember, the Jebusites were, the, were those individuals who were supposed to be destroyed. Uh, if you uh, look over here at... Um, uh, sorry, the Jebu right here. If you look, if you look over here at uh, uh, um, Joshua 15 and verse six, 63, it says, Now as for the Jebusites, the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the sons of Judah could not drive them out. So the Jebusites lived with the sons of Judah at Jerusalem until this day. Now, this day is referring to when Joshua was written. And what, the, what that says is that these, that Jerusalem was a stronghold. Now, I don't know if you remember when David killed Goliath. And it made a statement that when David killed Goliath, that he took the head to Hebron. I'm sorry, he took the head to Jerusalem. And there's two ways you can look at that, and we're not sure which way is the right way. Uh, one is that you could look at it and say that he immediately took the head of, of Goliath to Jerusalem. And if that's the case, then he took it there, taunting, uh, taunting Jerusalem, the, the Jebusites, taunting them because they weren't supposed to be living in the land. They were supposed to have been destroyed when Joshua entered the land, but they were too mighty and too strong, and the, and the city of, of Jerusalem was too well fortified, and therefore they weren't able to, to take it. And so all this time, David, who, who lives in Bethlehem, which isn't very far from, from Jerusalem, probably looked at that city as a symbol of uh, of the Canaanites' uh, defiance that Israel couldn't remove them or wasn't able to get rid of them uh, all up to this time when they should have remembered that they were supposed to get rid of all of the Canaanites who lived in the land, but because of their sin, you might say, they, they left some, and Jerusalem was one of those cities that they left that was filled with Jebusites, and so those, those Jebusites inhabited the land, and they said to David, you shall not come in here. Oh, by the way, the, the second way to, to look at, at the statement that's made about, about David bringing the head of Goliath uh, into Jerusalem is that when David becomes king and conquers Jerusalem, that one of the things he does is brings in the head of Goliath, uh, if, you know, assuming that he still had it. And it could be that that's what's meant, that he brings in the head of Goliath uh, and that that head is a symbol of David's victory over uh, not, not only the Philistines, but, but also the Jebusites. And so that's probably, uh, I think the latter is probably what's under consideration, although the, the former might, might be it because we're, we don't really know which way. Uh, it just simply says that. But whichever way, David felt that Jerusalem needed to be taken down. So now that he's united as the king of Israel, he's... he's uh, uh, ruler over Israel and Judah, so that they're now this united front, they're going to come up against Jerusalem, and they're going to, you know, take the city, and this could be a, a uh, what's a good word, a, a validation of David's ability to rule, that he's finally going to take out the, these foreign cities, that this foreign city, the Jebusites, that should have been taken out a long time ago when the children of Israel came in, and it says, that when he comes up against these people, they said to David, you shall not come in here, but the blind and the lame will turn you away, thinking David could not uh, enter, enter here. As I mentioned before, this was the city that was a, an old city. When Joshua was there, it was there, and the Jebusites were there, and they weren't able to conquer the city. They weren't able to take it, uh, who, whosever territory it was, and I believe it was in Benjamin, uh, Benjamin wasn't able to take them. 
uh, or, or sorry, uh, Judah. And uh, Judah wasn't able to, to overpower them, so they left them there. Uh, and, and so as a result of that, Jerusalem, having been there for, oh, at, at least uh, 500, maybe 600 years since, since the children of Israel lived in the land, and you might say they were just considered this city that you shouldn't go to because there are these foreigners, and so they were always maybe like a thorn in the flesh, but th th that also showed how difficult it was to remove them, and so there they would get real, real um, confident. And when David came up, they said to him, you're not going to be able to break in here. You're not, that's what he means by not come in here. I mean, you're not going to be able to defeat us and enter through the gates uh, be, uh, because the blind and the lame will be able to turn you away. In other words, their, their fortifications are so strong that blind people and lame people will be able to man the walls and be able to keep them out uh, and so that's why it says, thinking David cannot enter here. So that's what's under consideration uh, when we see the statement here, just meant that's made by David uh, or about David. Verse 7 says, nevertheless, David captured the stronghold of Zion. That is the city of David. So this Jerusalem became what's known as the stronghold of Zion or the city of David. And he captured it. He captured the stronghold of Zion and it became the city of David. And so David had been living around that area when he was fleeing from, from uh, Saul. Uh, and, and now it was going to become his stronghold. And it was going to be his city. And so nevertheless, David captured the stronghold of Zion, that is the city of David. Now, how did he do that? Well, verse 8 says, David said on that day, the day that he captured it, whoever would strike the Jebusites, let him reach the lame and the blind who are hated by David's soul through the water tunnel. Therefore, they say, say the, the blind or the lame shall not come into the house. In other words, this statement is kind of a, a strange statement. This isn't saying that David doesn't like uh, lame and blind people, but it's talking about the fact that David doesn't like those blind and lame people who Jerusalem put on the walls to mock David. Now, remember that even though they were blind and lame, uh, they were still supposed to be killed because they, they were Jebusites and they were Canaanites and they, they were supposed to be killed, you know, many years prior, but, but uh, Israel never had been strong enough until David becomes king. And so that's what it means when it says, whoever would strike the Jebusites, let him reach the lame and the blind, because the Jebusites said that the, they can put the lame and the blind on the wall and David won't be able to come in. In other words, the blind and the lame will be able to defeat David because their fortifications are so good. Uh, but David says, whoever, whoever will reach the, the lame and the blind who are hated by David, so now remember, they're hated not because they're blind and lame, but because they're, they're Canaanite and they're also defying God. And so it doesn't matter whether you're well or whether you're sick, if you're defying God, uh, the punishment is going to still be the same. Uh, and it says through the water tunnel. Now, J Jerusalem and most cities uh, would need water in order to function. And many times the way that, that armies would capture cities is by surrounding the city and not letting any food get in and not letting any water come in or, or um, rerouting the, the water that was going in there. But apparently the city of David had a well that was so deep that it, it said that it was somewhere around 40 feet deep. Uh, and so, so therefore, they could get water and there was no way to really cut it off. They knew where it was, but there wasn't, there wasn't any way to, you know, for example, to, to shut the flow off because it, it, was, it was so deep. But uh, apparently you could, you could uh, get in through there. And so David, you know, what David is saying is, is that, that you know, when it, when it makes this statement here that says, uh, through the water tunnel, David was giving them the strategy for taking the city. In other words, the strategy for taking the city wasn't going to be to surround it and, you know, keep provisions from coming in and, you know, starving out the people. His, his strategy was they were going to sneak in through the tunnel, through the water tunnel, which the, the Jebusites didn't think could possibly be done, and then crawling up through the, through the tunnel and then probably opening the, 
the doors and allowing the children of Israel to come in or David's forces to come in. And, and if they did that, it says, therefore, they say, the blind and the lame shall not come into the house. In other words, what that means is, the, this is the act, actual opposite of what the Jebusites were saying. The Jebusites were saying that the blind and the lame live in there, and they're the ones that are going to keep David out. But after David defeats him, David says, the blind and the lame aren't going to be able to come in here. In other words, they're, they're going to be defeated. And so that's, that's that statement that's made there that seems a little funny as you first read it. It's not really saying that David is against, you know, cripples or that David is against the handicapped, but he's talking about that particular city that used their handicapped people to keep David out, if in reality they did that or whether it was just a saying. So verse 9 says, so David lived in the stronghold and called it the city of David. And David built all around from the um, Millo and inward. In other words, David even fortified the city better than it had been before so that they could make sure that uh, they were well, well fortified in case of an invasion. And so in verse 10, it says, And David grew greater and greater, for the Lord God of hosts was with him. And so uh, the scripture just simply says that David... Uh, gained great access or, or great success. And the reason wasn't because David was so good is because God was with him. And we need to remember that, that if God is with us, we can be successful. Uh, that's why a uh, Philippian says that I can do all things through him who strengthens me. In other words, we can do everything God wants us to do because he's the one that's going to strengthen us for the task. And so it that doesn't matter whether you're taking a city in the name of God or whether you're preaching the word of God to somebody else. It doesn't matter what in the world is going on. Uh, if, if God wants you to do it, then God's going to give you the strength to do it, and you'll be able to succeed. And that's why David succeeded, because God said he was going to be king of Israel. And as king, he needed to be successful. And so God allowed him to be successful. Uh, and he therefore built the, the Milo and inward. All right, now, beginning at verse 10, or uh, verse 11. So, so now David's become king. He's defeated Jerusalem, that thorn in the flesh, uh, that, that group of people that were, that were uh, Canaanites that should have been destroyed. David finally got rid of them, and he was able to bring the head of Goliath in there, or he had taunted them with it before, and so therefore he validated that taunting by taking the city. Now, now that he's king, now that he's secure, now that he has conquered, um, you know, that, that difficult group of people that were there and proven his, his, um, his power, uh, it's going to talk to us about Hiram, who is the king of Tyre. And let's see what it says. 2 Kings 5, verse 11, uh, 2 Samuel 5, verse 11. Then Hiram, king of Tyre, sent messengers to David with cedar, trees, and carpenters, and stonemasons, and they built a house for David. And David realized that the Lord had established him as king over Israel, and that he had exalted his kingdom. And that he had, that he had exalted his kingdom. Sorry about that. So uh, it says in verse 11, Then Hiram, king of Tyre, sent messengers to David and, uh, with cedar, trees and carp carpenters and stonemasons, and they built a house for David. And David realized that the Lord had established him as king over Israel, and that he had exalted his kingdom for the sake of his people Israel. Meanwhile, David took more concubines and wives from Jerusalem after he came from Hebron, and more sons and daughters were born to David. Now these are the names of those who were born to him in Jerusalem, uh, Shuma, uh, Shobab, Nathan, Solomon, Ibhar, uh, e Elisha, uh, Nepheg, uh, Japhia, Elishema, Elida, and Elphelet. And so as we notice here, 
uh, David then, because he's king and because he's seen in, as king and recognized as king, King Hiram then makes an agreement with him to bring him cedar trees and stonemasons. The uh, uh, Sidonians or the people from Tyre were individuals who were very good at, at carpentry and were very good at, at being stonemasons and, and making statues and building things. They were, they were great builders. And so David contracted with them to build David his house. And so that's the house that David built or his palace in Jerusalem. And as David is on his, his house, this house that he made, it says in verse 12, and David realized that the Lord had established him as king over Israel and that he had exalted his kingdom for the sake of his people Israel. And so David realized as he began to see his success and no doubt as he began to see his house and his house was built, that he understood that the Lord had established him. And I want you to notice a couple of things here. I want you to notice, first of all, that David realized that the Lord was the one who did this. The Lord established him. Yes, David had to fight the battles. Yes, David had to stay faithful. Yes, David had to, to, to do, you might say, the work or put his faith into practice. And, and all of that was necessary. But David recognizes that it's the Lord who's, do, who's, who's done this for him. Now, that's not the same thing as predestination. That's not the same thing as God saying, I'm going to do it no matter what you do or what happens to you. Because we understand what happens to David a little bit later on in his life when he does sin and the problems that it causes. But what this is showing us is that as long as the Lord is with David, then David's kingdom would be established. And, uh, and unlike Saul's kingdom, when the Lord left Saul, then Saul's kingdom failed. And so David recognizes that everything he has is from the Lord. And that, he, and that his kingdom was established from the Lord, that the Lord did it. Now, I want you to notice why the Lord did it. The Lord didn't do it just to make David great. The Lord did it for his people, Israel. So God gave David the talents that he gave him, and God allowed David to become king. And he did that not just for David, although David certainly got some recognition. God gave David the, the gifts and the qualities he gave him for his people, Israel. And that's true for us today, that we, we need to understand that whatever talents we have, we're supposed to use those for God. We're supposed to use those for his people. We're not supposed to use them for ourselves. We're, we're not supposed to be selfish individuals who just use the gifts that we have for our own selfish interests. We're supposed to be individuals who use our talents and our gifts as God would want us to and as God, and as God would expect of us to use. And I'm trying to find the verse that I want. And for some reason, I can't find it off the top of my head. Uh, for sake of rest, yeah. No, let me see. I don't think it's five. No. No. Hang on. I don't think it's three. It's not two. Maybe it is five. Oh, yeah, here it is. Sorry. Um, I got confused. So in First Peter chapter 4 and verse 11, I want you to notice what it says. Well, actually starting here with verse 10. First Peter 4 and verse 10 says, as each one has received a special gift employ it in serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Whoever speaks is to do so as one who is speaking the utterance of God. Whoever serves is to do so as one who is serving by the strength which God supplies, so that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belongs the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. And so this verse is, is saying the same thing that we looked at over here in, in 2 Samuel 5, where David is talking about the fact that God made him king and God established his kingdom for the sake of Israel. You see, God was made king, uh, God made David king for the sake of Israel. And, and in order that Israel could be blessed, God is always doing everything for his people. And he therefore he raises people up with certain talents for his people's sake. We need to remember that. So whatever talents we have, whether it's the gift of prophecy or the, you know, whatever gift we might have, whether, whether it's the gift of, uh, 
graciousness or kindness, or maybe we have the gift of teaching, or whatever gift God has given to us, we are to use it for the benefit of God's people. That's, that's the difference between how we used to use our resources before we were Christians and how we use them after we're Christians. Before we were Christians, we used them selfishly for our, for our own means or our own goals, but now we use them for God or his means and for his goal. And so that's what's under consideration uh, when he says that he made David king and exalted him and established his kingdom for the sake of his people, Israel. So remember that we have a greater calling than just our own gratification. Our calling is to help the cause of Christ. Now, well, that's going on. It says, meanwhile, David took more concubines and wives from Jerusalem after he came from Hebron and more sons and daughters were born to David. Now, I'm not going to go through the names of these. As you can tell, sometimes I have a little bit of trouble with those names. I don't know why they just can't be named Bob and Sally and, you know, uh, Beth. But nonetheless, <laughs> uh, you can read the names for yourself. But what this also shows us is while God is doing things for his people, God blesses those people through whom he is working. And here God is blessing David. And again, uh, David is a man after God's own heart. And though David was a man after God's own heart, David took more concubines and wives, even though Jesus, when he was asked about marriage and divorce, said God only planned one woman and one man. That's the way God planned it. He didn't plan for man to have concubines or multiple wives. Now, God is allowing this, and some people uh, you know, have all kinds of reasons why God's allowing it, but uh, nonetheless, God, it, God is allowing it even though it's not really his strict, the, his strict will or his strict desire for men to have a bunch of wives and a bunch of concubines. And so when we get to Jesus in the New Testament, that's why that practice it, it falls away. Because in Jesus, we understand the true meaning of that marriage relationship. One man, one woman for life. But nonetheless, David had concubines and wives, and he lived in Jerusalem, and, uh, and he came from Hebron, in other words, where he'd been stationed before, and more sons and daughters were born to David. So he, he has more sons and daughters when he finally comes to Jer Jerusalem, besides the, the uh, children he had while he was in Hebron. And so I'm not going to get into all those children, but there was quite a, quite, a, quite a number of children that were under consideration. Now, in verse 17, um, we're going to notice now that uh, David is now going to have a conflict with the Philistines. And you, you, you might wonder why this is happening at this time. Well, let me remind you of a couple of things. Remember that when Saul was after David, David went and hid with the Philistines. And so the Philistines were individuals who knew about David. And when David then took over Judah, they weren't really that concerned about David uh, because they didn't see David so much as a threat because uh, he, he was still divided from the rest of Israel. And the Philistines' hold wasn't just over Judah. It was over all of Israel. Uh, and so they weren't overly concerned. But now, but now that David is going to unify the nation and unify the country, then we're going to notice that the Philistines feel like they have to do something. So let's begin reading at verse 17. It says, when the, when the Philistines heard that they had anointed David King over Israel, all the Philistines went up to seek out David. And when David heard of it, he went down to the stronghold. Now the Philistines came and spread themselves out in the valley of Rephaim. And then, then David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I go up against the Philistines? Will you give them into my hand? And the Lord said to David, Go up, for I will certainly give the Philistines into your hands. So David came to Baal. Perazim, and defeated them there. And he said, the Lord has broken through my enemies. The Lord has broken through my enemies before me like the breakthrough of waters. Therefore, he named that place Baal Perazim. They abandoned their idols there. So David and his men carried them away. Now the Philistines came up once again and spread themselves out in the valley of Rimphaim. And when David inquired of the Lord, he said, You shall not go directly up, circle around behind them, and come at them in front of the uh, balsam trees. It shall be when you hear the sound of marching in the tops 
of the balsam trees, then you shall act promptly for, for then the Lord will have gone out before you to strike the army of the Philistines. And then David did so just as the Lord had commanded him and struck down the Philistines from Geba as far as Gezer. Now, in verse 17, we now have how the Philistines react. We notice how some of the other foreign kings reacted when, when, uh, um, when the king of, of Tyre came and offered David Hiram, couldn't think of his name, when, the, when King Hiram came and offered David uh, his, his um, talents in, in building, uh, it shows us that, that David is being recognized by other national kings. And so here now the Philistines are recognizing David, not just being a splinter king, but actually being the whole king of Israel. And now they're a little concerned because they had always, because the Philistines had always been fighting against Israel, and Israel had always been fighting against the Philistines. Uh, and now that David is over all of them, they're concerned about what's going to go on. And so they come out to fight against David to see what's going to happen. Verse 17 says, when the Philistines heard that they had anointed David king over Israel, all the Philistines went up to seek out David. You know, it kind of reminds me of, of Jesus and um, Revelation chapter 12, where as soon as Satan figures out that God wants to bring about his king and make him king, that Satan does everything he can to try to defeat uh, God's king, Jesus. And that's what you have going on here. Here you have the enemies uh, of Israel, the Philistines, and now that David has been securely positioned as king and ruler, they come out to fight against him in order to defeat him, in order to defeat God's plans. And that's the same thing that happened in Revelation chapter 12, and that's what you see going on in Matthew chapter 4, I'm sorry, in, in Matthew chapter, uh, uh, in uh, Matthew chapter 2, where um, where Herod wants to kill all of the babies that, that are two years old and younger to try to kill Jesus. And certainly we understand that Satan is using Herod in order to try to defeat uh, God's king. And here we know that Satan is using the Philistines to try to defeat God's king. But it says, they went up to seek out David. And when David heard of it, he went down to the stronghold. So when David hears about it, he, he rallies his men and he gathers at the stronghold in order so he can you know, hold a defensive position. And it says, now the Philistines came and spread themselves out in the valley of Rephaim. And so here they are in this valley. Remember how they were when they fought against the Philistines with Goliath and Goliath would march up and down in between the two armies. And basically that's what we have here going on. But they're in the valley of uh, Rephaim. It says, then David inquired of the Lord, saying, shall I go up to, against the Philistines? Now, I want you to notice that David, we always see David inquiring of the Lord. He always asked the Lord, what shall I do? And so one of the things that shows us is the value of prayer. And I know today that God doesn't necessarily answer us exactly the same way he answered David, because one of the ways that he used to answer David was by Urim and Thummim and by the priests uh, and the prophets. And today we don't have Urim and Thummim. Uh, and so we don't get these, these messages from God like they did back then, as God was trying to direct the fulfillment of his promise to, to the world about bringing a Savior, because the Savior is already here. And so therefore, we don't need any necessarily specific direct revelation from God in order to know uh, uh, what to do in order for the kingdom to be established, because the kingdom already is established. And I'd suggest to you, that's one of the big differences uh, between the New Testament period and what we have right now. New Testament period was the building period for the kingdom and the proclamation of the kingdom. But now that it's been fully made known, God doesn't have to run around giving us special instruction. But nonetheless, what this does show us is the value and the importance of prayer. We're to pray all at all times, and we're to pray giving God thanks uh, at all times. And so David prays to God to find out if he should go up against the Philistines. And it says, will you give them into my hand? In other words, he asked God, will you be, be on my side? Uh, and notice that David doesn't presume that he's automatically going to win just because he is an Israelite. Uh, just because we're Christians doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to get what we want. Because it's not what we want. It's God's plans that, that are important. It's thy will be done, which is the reason why in the Lord's Prayer, 
before we ask for our daily bread and before we ask God to lead us out of temptation, the, <clears throat> the first thing that we ask after we recognize who God is, is we pray that your kingdom come, your will be done. So God's will and God's kingdom precedes any desires or any wishes that we may have. And that's what you see going on here. And uh, that's the reason that David prays. And David doesn't assume that God is just automatically going to allow David to win because he's, he's his, because David is God's anointed. And that's the reason why David prays. He prays to find out, do you want me to go up against them? Do you want us to, to defeat them or not? And it says, and the Lord said to David, go up, for I, I will certainly give the Philistines into your hands. And of course, the, the real question is, is just exactly how does that work? Uh, how does that work that, that the Lord talks to him? Well, like I pointed out before, God talked to them through Urim, Thummim, and priests, and they, they still have the priesthood back then. Today, it's not necessarily the same because the situation is not the same. And so here it says, will, will you give them into my hand? And the Lord said to David, go up, for I will certainly give the Philistines into your hand. So again, David is not assuming that he's just going to be victorious because he's one of God's people, but he's putting his trust and his dependence on God. And whatever, you go, whatever will you want, God, is the will that David is, is willing to do. So if, David, if God doesn't want David to go up, then he's not going to go up. Now, verse 20. So David came to Baal Perazim and defeated them there. And he said, the Lord has broken through my enemies before me like the breaking through waters. Therefore, he named the place Baal uh, Perazim. Now, um, I, I think it's probably important for us to stop here and, talk, and think for just a minute about this expression, Baal or Baal, however you want to pronounce that. Um, and, and because it's generally associated with a pagan god, you know, that they, they worship Baal is who they, who they worshiped. And so when you see it, Baal Perazin, you know, it's kind of like, well, just exactly what does that mean? Well, what you need to understand is that the word Baal also just came to mean master or lord. Uh, because it was their term for God. That was how they said God. It's kind of like uh, when you talk about the, the Islam, and they talk about God as Allah. Allah is just the name they have for God. It, it doesn't necessarily imply an Israelite, I mean, a, a, um, uh, a um, Islamic God. It just, it just is the word that they use for God. And so therefore, our, you know, Jehovah could be referred to as Allah, because he's a God. But of course, we have, we recognize him as a specific God. Well, that's the same thing with this word Baal that's in front of here. Uh, it's not God broke through the devil, but it's the master broke through. So the Lord, see, that's why it says, the, uh, it says he called it that, because the Lord has broken through. He's not calling He's not saying that the Lord they're following is some false god named Baal, but Baal is the title or the word for Lord. And though we often think of it in the Old Testament as being ref referring to the false god, uh, it doesn't necessarily imply that it has to be. It's just simply the term for Lord. And that's why it says Baal Perazim. So the Lord, our God, broke through. Perazim means to break through the lines. And like the breaking of water, like a flood. And so that's why he named it that. And so he says, therefore, he named that place Baal Perazin, because the Lord broke through in order to defeat Israel. In other words, God was fighting with them. And God often fights with them. Okay. And, and it's referred to as here, if you notice in this little footnote, it's referred to as the plain of breaches. It's what it's referred to. And, and there it is there. In, in Isaiah 28, verse 21, for the Lord will rise up uh, as at Mount Perazin, which means the breach, and he will stir up, uh, uh, and he will be stirred up as in the valley of Gibeon to do his task. In other words, uh, in, in Isaiah, the context here is that God's going to fight uh, for his people, and so he's going to fight for them like he did at Perazin when he made the breach, and like he did at Gibeon when, when the sun didn't go down for a, um, a whole day uh, because God was fighting with them. And so that's what you have here. Uh, and so it, it says that as a, as a result of that, it says the Lord broke through my enemies uh, and therefore the name of that place was 
Baal Perazin, and they, they abandoned their idols there. So David and his men carried them away. Now, notice that, that um, the Philistines abandoned their idols. This is exactly the opposite of what we saw in the book of Samuel when the Philistines came down and fought against uh, Israel during the days of uh, Eli. Remember Eli the prophet? And they took the, the Ark of the Covenant and uh, to, the, to the battlefield, thinking that if they had the Ark of the Covenant there, that God would be with them. But instead, they were defeated, and the Philistines took the Ark of the Covenant. Well, here you see, here you see the exact opposite of that. Here, here you see God's king taking their idols, not to, not to, to imply that, that the Ark of the Covenant is an idol. It certainly is not, but uh, it, it represents Jehovah, and their idols here are used to represent their God. And so they abandoned their idols there, and so David and his men carried them away. Now, the difference between this time and when, when the Philistines took the Ark of the Covenant is that, is that God allowed the Philistines to defeat Israel. And we know that because when they took the Ark of the Covenant into the Temple of Dagon, the next day they found Dagon on the floor. And then this, the, the subsequent day, they found uh, Dagon with his hands broken off, uh, again on the floor before the Ark of the Covenant. And so what that's saying is, is that God was the one who allowed the Philistines to defeat Israel and take them. But here, they abandoned them. And they carried them away. And, and there's no mention when they carried them away of any kind of curses coming upon Israel, of any kind of bad events like with the Philistines when they took the Ark of the Covenant and they ended up having tumors and boils and, and probably hemorrhoids uh, and rats, a plague of rats. Uh, it says nothing about Israel suffering any of these consequences because they carried away the idols. And the other thing I want you to notice is that it says they carried them away because idols can't move. They can't get to one place or another on their own. And so it shows you that uh, uh, God's anointed David and his army had defeated the Philistines and, and drove them out. Now, that was the first time since the kingdom was united that David beat the Philistines. So now the Philistines go back and they gather even more people together. They're, they're probably thinking that their forces weren't big enough. And so if we have a bigger army, we'll be able to defeat them. And so it doesn't matter whether we have a big army or a little army. If God wants us to win, we're going to win. And if God wants us to lose, we're going to lose. It depends on what God wants. But anyway, it says in verse 22, Now the Philistines came up once again and spread themselves out in the valley of uh, Raphim. Again, notice that they're coming out to fight. They've already lost in this valley once. They're coming to fight again. Uh, they're coming to fight again. And it says, and when David inquired of the Lord, he said, you shall not go directly up. Circle around behind them and come at them in front of the balsam trees. It shall be when you hear the sound of the marching in the tops of the balsam trees, then you shall act promptly. So this time God tells David, yes, uh, I do want you to go fight against them, but I don't want you to make a frontal assault. I want you to assault them from the rear or the sides, wherever these balsam trees were. It sounded like it was behind them. Uh, and so they're going to come in behind them instead of in front of them. Uh, and they're going to wait, however. They're going to wait for a sound. And the sound that they're going to wait for is the sound of the marching in the tops of the balsam trees. Then you shall act promptly. And you know, that reminds me of Acts chapter 2, that the children of uh, the Christians began to preach the kingdom of Jesus and to demonstrate the power of Jesus after they heard the noise of the spirit like a rushing mighty wind. Uh, and remember, they had the cloven tongues of fire and, and the Holy Spirit was, had fallen on them. And that's kind of what you have here uh, from the standpoint of an army, that this army is waiting to be victorious and to be, and to be blessed. And they're the army of God. They are the, the, they are the kingdom of God in military force, you might say. And therefore, God says that they're to wait until they hear the balsam trees, the marching in the tops of the balsam trees, like if somebody's marching on top of the trees. And it says, then you shall act promptly. So they're supposed to, that's when they're supposed to fight when they hear this. Now, why are they supposed to do that? Then he says, for then the Lord 
will have gone out before you to strike the army of the Philistines. So God says, the reason you have to wait is because I'm going to go and do your fighting for you. I'm the one who's going to go fight. Okay. I'm the one who's going to go defeat, defeat them. Uh, and and uh, this was also something that was done uh, during the battle that uh, Elisha had when I believe it was Assyria that came up and they had surrounded the city and Elisha's um, servant was worried because there were so many of them and Elisha asked God to open his eyes. When he opened his eyes, he saw all the flaming chariots that were between Elisha and the Assyrian army that God had sent to defeat them. And so we have to understand that there's more going on than just our physical, the physical things in our, in our world that's happening. There's more stuff going on than that. There's a spiritual battle going on. And God doesn't have to let us see everything that's happening. We just have to believe that it's going to happen. And so David here just had to believe that once he heard the sound of the marching in the tops of the trees, that he was to act promptly, or then the Lord will go out before you and strike the army of the Philistines. That's the same thing that you have in, in uh, Revelation chapter 18, I believe, and it could be 19, where you have the, the word of God fighting against the forces of the devil, and he rides in front of them, and God's the, God's the one who does it. The, the, the word of God rides in front. He's the one that has his garments stained with the blood of his enemies, whereas his people that are coming behind him, they're wearing white garments because they don't have to do the fighting because their king had already done the fighting. And that's what you have going on here. So even though David is the king of Israel, God is the one who is in charge and God is the one who is going to fight for David and fight against the Philistines. And then it says in verse 25, then David did so, just as the Lord had commanded him, and struck down the Philistines from Geba as far as Gezer. And so basically what it says is that God then defeated them and destroyed them. And so remember that God fights for us. He always does, and he always will. And he's looking for people who trust him and believe what he says. And so uh, it's like today. Uh, he, he tells them in a, in a number of passages in the book of Acts that those people who became his people were baptized in the name of Jesus Christ in order to have their sins forgiven. And those people who believe him then are baptized in the name of Jesus. Those people who don't believe him, they, you know, pray the sinner's prayer, although you can't find that in the scriptures, uh, in order to, to be converted or become one of God's people. Uh, that's not what you find in the scriptures. Uh, you don't find that, uh, and yet uh, uh, here uh, you have the same thing. If you do what God says and you trust what God says, then God's going to accomplish what he says he will accomplish for you, and that's true for us today. So I pray God blesses you, pray God keeps you, and we'll start with Second Samuel chapter 6 next week.